November 7th meeting of the Auburn School Committee and welcome to all our special guests and parents this evening. We're going to begin the meeting the way we begin every meeting. So I'm going to invite everyone to stand and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Here we go. I pledge All right, now the next thing I always do is I ask people to introduce themselves around this big circle, okay? So I always start, all of our guests here, I always start down here to my right. So we're going to go that way, and it's going to go right around, and you're going to learn our names, okay? All right, we'll start down here on the right, please. Dan Poisson, Ward 5. Brian Belknap, Ward 4. Pam Hart, Ward 2. Karen Matthew, Ward 3. Connie Brown, Superintendent. Connie Brown, Superintendent. <laughs> Mayor Jason Levesque. <clears throat> Pat Gaudier at large. Pam Albert at large. Jillian Dume, student representative. Abigail Fauche, student representative. Gabriel Desperado, student representative. Mark Conrad, business manager. Sue Doris, assistant superintendent. Okay, that's all of us who are around this shoehorn. So now we have to do this much business for two seconds, and then it's you guys, okay? So give us two seconds, all right? All right, everyone, let's start with, I need a motion for the approval of tonight's agenda, including the minutes from the 11 22 meeting, as well as the 11 22 Do I have a motion? So moved. So moved. moved. Thank second. you, Brian. Uh, first, Brian, Pam, can I second? Yes. Any questions, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion passes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to use chair prerogative to move tonight's presentation up. So that's you guys. We would like to give a big warm welcome to Mrs. Brooks. Is she there somewhere? Oh, she's there. Hi, Mrs. Brooks. To Mrs. Brooks and the Washburn and Walton Elementary Chorus Holiday Melody. We hear you have some, th some things to sing for us tonight. Is that true? Yeah. All right. So I think you need to face Mrs. Brooks right there, and we'll turn our listening ears on for you guys.
slippers down. North Pole slippers. We don't need our papers for this. Better listen and watch.
right out into the hallway and then your parents can find you out there. Yeah, no, look, so go ahead, Bob. Go ahead, Avery. Thank you. Hey, Mrs. Brooks, thank you. Before you head out, hey, little friends, thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you, families, for bringing your kiddos for us to be here, uh, to be able to hear them. We wish you a wonderful holiday season. Merry Christmas and happy holidays. Thank you again, families. We appreciate it. It was wonderful. We're just for those of you watching, we're just pausing for a moment to allow folks to file out after that performance. Hi. Thank you. Probably there are a couple of conferences right now. <laughs> and we can't close those doors because it's a public meeting. Those who are coming and coming in. All right, we're going to continue on with the meeting, but because it's a public meeting, we cannot close the doors. We have lots of folks congregated out there, so we may just need to speak up a little uh, louder into your mic, everyone. All right, at this time, I'm going to open up public participation to anyone who would like to address the school committee at this time. The mic is open and live. Anyone like to come address the school committee? All right, seeing none, I'll move on. So, school committee student rep report. Gabe, I believe you're on this evening. <coughs> so.
So although you can't see it outside, the holidays are near us. It is getting colder, slightly. No snow, sadly, but that doesn't stop the school, <laughs> uh, the schools from celebrating the holiday season. So I'm here to share all the holiday events that will be happening around the Auburn School District. So Sherwood Heights um, music kids in grades K through three participated in an American sing-along on November 30th. This was their first performance event since 2019 and 2020, so pre-pandemic. This evening, Sherwood Heights students in grade four through six in chorus will get the opportunity to perform in their own American sing-along. Um, and there was a shout out from Mrs. Klein to Lisa Mayer, Sherwood Heights music teacher, for her planning and preparation in all her music events. For East Auburn Community School, um, they're getting a holiday spirit and partnering with local businesses and agencies to provide holiday assistance to some of East Auburn's families. Some of these local businesses include the United Methodist Church, the Auburn Fire Department, and All About You Salon. Um, they are not new with All About You Salon. If you remember, I shared this last year as well. They did a couple great things for them. In addition to that, on December 9th, East Auburn is sponsoring a holiday help hat day when staff and students can choose to donate a dollar or more to wear a hat for the day. All proceeds will help to purchase special winter items to distribute. Um, on December 9th, also, students will be making crafts and cards to share with our local veterans. Fairview um, is having a lot of things happening. They have their 12 days of vacation. Um, so I think my sister goes to Fairview, and today's the 8th, so she had a crazy hair day. Um, she did. Uh, tomorrow is flannel day, and then next week consists of beach day, silly sock day, and they have kind of team colors, and then sunglasses day, fancy day, tiger day. It's a really great 12 days of vacation they had. For Walton School, they recently had their annual turkey bingo, where over 200 participants gathered for a free and fun-filled night at um, evening as a school community. Uh, winners of the games received board games to promote family game nights. Thanks to Hannaford's and Panera, they also gave away 11 turkeys and over 80 baked good as door prizes, so everyone won something. Walton School is connected with several local organizations that are supporting many of their families with holiday needs. Gifts, gift cards, and food baskets will be distributed to as many families as they can. Uh, Mr. Davis gives a big shout out to Da Vinci's Eatery for their surprise lunch and for their Walton staff. On Wednesday, November 30th, Walton staff was treated to a yummy lunch completed with chicken parm, dirty peas, salad, and of course, garlic nuts. Um, <laughs> Walton staff was very thankful for their generosity. On Washburn, uh, on Friday, December 9th, Washburn will be hosting a holiday movie night for their students and parents. I don't know what the movie night is, but I am interested. In. Uh, and on December 22nd, students will be singing uh, Christmas carols. Thanks to their music teacher, Mrs. Brooks, they will provide uh, their parents with a Zoom link to be able to watch and listen to their students. Edward Little High School. Um, every year, Mrs. Ressian hosts a gift shop in her room and puts uh, free gifts such as kitchenware, toys, or clothing um, for as many ELHS students as possible so they can take it home with them for those who can't afford it. This year, the Student Leadership Council has been tasked with helping Ms. Soretzian. Um, and with our committee of seven or so, I want to say we collected at least $600 worth of material in cash and physical item donations, such as kitchenware, clothing, uh, and toys. So I'm very happy with that. Uh, and the music department, the ELHS music department has been... Uh, Busy going around Lewis and Auburn performing at the Franco Center for both the Nutcracker and their holiday bands concert. I believe the choir performed at the Nutcracker that the Franco hosts annually. Sadly, I was not able to get any information on Park Ave, Frank Law Alternative, or AMS, but those are all the holiday specials happening. Nice. Lots going on in the district. Wonderful. Thank you, Gabe. All right. Superintendent's report. Dr. Brown. Thank you very much, Chairperson Matthew. The first item on my report is budget update. The administrator's budgets were due December 2nd, that was last Friday, and they have been turned in. Mr. Conrad is in the process of incorporating the information, putting the budget binders together, and then we will begin our meetings with them in January. The first meeting with the school committee is the first Wednesday in March, so we'll start that process, but that is well underway. The second item on my report is I included in your packet a five-year enrollment history of the Auburn School Department. I think it's been a little bit since you've had a longer look at other than just the current year's enrollment. One of the things that we're watching pretty carefully is that we have dropped about 300 students between 2019 and 2022. And as we go through the budget process, we'll do more of an analysis about what grades have been impacted and we are working with the city regarding what areas of the city might reflect that enrollment drop. And that is a good segue into the next item on my report. 
Mr. Conrad and I met with the architects from Harriman to discuss the board goal, which is to create a master plan for our facilities to evaluate the capacity, sufficiency, and structural quality. They will make a preliminary presentation to the Finance Committee tomorrow and then a complete presentation to the School Committee in January. And you will have that information for budget development purpose, purposes for 23-24. Uh, Mr. Conrad, do you want to add anything to those two items? Uh, it, it will be a very extensive study, and it's going to take some time, but it's something we feel is important to get off the ground now. So a lot, you'll be hearing a lot about this over the next few months, I think. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. The next on my, item, on my report is an update on transportation. Mr. Dote, Mr. Holland, if you would come up, please. These folks are overseeing the transportation of the Auburn School Department, and uh, we've had some challenges with our busing. So without further ado, Dennis, Thank help you. us understand what they have been. Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dennis Dote, Public Works Director. I have uh, Scott Holland, uh, Deputy Public Works Director with me. Uh, he's gonna uh, provide a little detail on some of the work we've been doing around recruiting and, and, and getting uh, these, these bus uh, runs filled. Um, as um, Superintendent uh, Brown alluded to, we've had a couple of bus runs um, empty um, or uh, un unseated with uh, drivers for the last few weeks uh, due to some personnel matters we just needed to address over that time. Um, the reality is what we've been doing is trying to rotate those cancellations around so the same parents and same students are not impacted over this time. Uh, but I'll go ahead and allow... Um, uh, Deputy Director Holland just to speak to the efforts that we've been going through and I think um, there is light at the end of the tunnel and we are uh, we are getting there um, to, towards that. Okay so we um, as Dennis said there's been a couple buses parked. Um, we've been trying to review that to see if there's any other alternatives and uh, we did we have come up with one so hopefully starting on Monday there'll only be one bus parked. We had to switch some drivers around to make this work. Um, but we do believe that we are set to go on Monday with only having one part. Now, we have four people in training right now. Um, and as I know I mentioned with the last update a few months ago, it takes a long time to go through the CDL training and the passenger and school bus endorsements. Um, out of those four, one is going for a test on December 20th. Um, that employee uh, had a date of November 14th and didn't pass the road test. Um, I just want to give clarification that on the 14th, she put in a couple days later and didn't get a test date back until December 20th, a month later. So it's, it's the state, you know, having those positions to get those drivers back in there. Uh, so she, that person goes on the 20th. Um, we have one that needed the full credential CDL passenger and school. Uh, he has recently got his permit and will be starting the road in the range training. Um, and as soon as he gets that under his belt, it's so many hours that he has to have, well, he'll be sending in for his license. We have two um, drivers that have their CDLs. One only needs the school bus endorsement, which he's gone through all of the theory part of that. Um, he, he's going to be starting his road training once he gets his permit. He has sent in for it, has not received the date back yet. And one other one that needs both the passenger and school, we've got the theory all done. It's just waiting for the test date to come back for the permit. So um, the one that we sent in with the CDL um, that, uh, that needed the full credential, um, it took him three weeks to get a date back once he sent his application in. So that's where we're having the trouble. We have the people there, you know, we'll be able to fill these buses that we do have parked and have a couple more that will fill some of the slots that are they're doubled up on runs. So, and we have an interview on Friday. So with a full CDL driver, he just needs the endorsements. So. It's just a little bit behind of what we're facing and trying to get people in here. Um, it's really tough. Thank you. I thank commend you for your efforts. Um, I, filling any position right now is almost impossible, but the, um, the criteria that you need to get behind the steering wheel of a bus is tremendous. And it is not like uh, people in the public have come up to us and said, where are the folks who used to drive all these buses? And I don't think all of the requirements were there 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that are required now of a bus driver. Am I correct? Abs I thought so. And we're so, fortunate. We have a trainer in-house, but right. he's a bus driver, so he's only doing it in between his runs. So it just takes a lot of time to get through all that. 
So in this day and age, I would say we were in a very, although we do have to cancel runs, uh, we are in a pretty good position to hopefully look forward and not have to ha get those daily phone calls. Okay, great. Any questions from the school committee? Yeah. The one bus that you're going to have parked on Monday, what will that affect? Who will that affect? See, we've been switching drivers around. I don't have that in front of me because, like I said, we're not trying to keep it the same bus. So we took like five or six drivers and split it up. So I'm not, I, gotta, I would have to look back to see what bus it is. It, it, it's stuff that's been sent out. So, so we've, been we've literally, I mean, up until close of business today, working these schedules, trying to make these, you know, as uh, Deputy Director uh, Holland, you know, said, we we just discovered a, a new way of, of actually covering an extra run. So we've had two um, un uncovered bus runs for the last few weeks. We believe we'll be down to one uncovered bus run. Um, and that's like, again, we can get the details out. We'll have that. We usually will put something out um, probably by, by Friday the latest, uh, announcing that which one will be affected on Monday. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh. Yeah. Uh, Pat, you need your mic on. Yeah. Would there be any point to um, contacting the state to see if they can do anything about pushing up those dates for these people? Um, the reality is I think the demand on the state is, is there. I think everyone is, um, is, is trying to get those dates, so I don't think it would do much. Um, I think uh, Deputy Director Holland has great relationship, actually, with uh, some of these folks, and I think actually some of the dates that we've enjoyed is because of that relationship. Um, and so we have, I think they're as good as they're probably going to get at this point. Yeah. I just have a question. I, I don't know if you guys can answer this or if this is more administration, but out of the students who have been affected, um, how are they getting to school and are there any that have been chronically absent as a result of the bus run issue? So we have been relying on parents, friends, community members to get kids to school and I don't have chronic absence data tonight to share with you. I can certainly look into that. Great. Any other questions? All right. Thank you both. And again, we applaud you for all your efforts. It's, it's not easy right now. So thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. Last item on my report is staffing vacancies. And at your place is a list of all of the professional positions and some support positions that we have, starting with AMS, which is Auburn Middle School. And if you see a parens beside a position, it means that we need two of them. So for example, teacher, special education, AMS, we need two positions. I'm interviewing tomorrow, Mr. Wilson, so hopefully that will be a good development. Uh, one of the things I wanted to share with the committee is that we do advertise vigorously. We are on school spring and serving schools. Diane Blay, who is the HR specialist, was at a career and job fair earlier in the early in November, I forget we're in December. Um, we advertise on Indeed. We do some advertising in local papers, but not a lot because it's expensive and we found that it doesn't really yield that great uh, of a number of candidates for us. And on, in terms of papers, say the Globe, um, it's thousands to advertise in the Globe and we, don't, we just don't see the yield for that. So we try to stick with the online venues. So that'll, that'll give you a sense of where we are with hiring. Uh, if you go down to bus drivers support services, uh, many of those or spares are substitutes and positions that we would like to have, but they are considered fill-ins at this point. And I'd be happy to answer any questions from the school committee. Any questions for Dr. Brown, Clarissa? So please use your mic, thank you. Uh, a few, oh, a few questions. One was earlier about the facility study. I just, um, I was curious about, I don't remember, did we vote? Like, did we have a choice of Harriman? I'm just curious as to how that choice came up. And then the other question is, um, in terms of these, this hiring, these vacancies, I can't, I don't know if it's like higher or lower than usual. So let me answer the first question, which was the process regarding the selection of Harriman. You may recall back, Mark, what, October, when the committee voted to accept the, what's the name of that project? The performance contract um, for the uh, HVAC upgrades. Yeah, so the, the committee did vote to award that to EEI, 
is EEI in partnership with Harriman. Thank you. And so the next conversation we had with them was to extend that work and to do the facility study that has been adopted by the committee as a board goal. If I, if I could note, that proposal is going to come forward to the school committee. That's right. right. Can you just say that again? I kind of missed it. I didn't understand totally. Sure. The proposal will first go to the Finance Committee, which I think is tomorrow, and then come to the full school committee in January, January 18th, I believe. And then your second question regarding vacancies. Uh, I didn't bring last year's or the year before, but I can certainly put that together for you if you're interested in it. If you're, and the question was if the vacancies are higher this year than in years past. Okay. Yeah. Um, I do have a question about the transportation, um, <clears throat> the MOU. We, um, the school is, is charged with sixty-two thousand six hundred dollars um, in order to have that um, partnership with the city, and I was just wondering where, what that sixty-two thousand six hundred dollars is used for. That's considered a management contract, and Dennis and Scott are part of the oversight of the transportation, custodial, and maintenance staffs. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Brown? Sorry, I have one last question, but this could be for later maybe, which is I was wondering what's happening with uh, transportation software and how it relates to this. I have, I have a meeting set up next week to speak with um, Mr. Dodo and, and the team with that. They've held off on beginning the implementation process because they didn't have the third position that they needed in the transportation office to begin the implementation. Now they've got that position with an assistant coordinator, and she's had a few weeks to be trained up, so I'm hoping that process will get underway soon, and once I can speak to the team, we can provide you with more information on the timeline. Okay, great questions. Any of you and any else? Pat? Just clarification, the 6250 is for half the year? That's correct. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Moving on, no school committee chairperson's report. City Council update, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, pretty light. I just want to make uh, the school committee and staff and students aware that our Christmas tree lighting will be downtown tomorrow at 6 p.m. Very exciting. Biggest lighting we've had in Auburn history, actually. Uh, that's going to coincide with the opening of our brand new Christmas, our European Christmas Village, which we're getting a lot of uh, great comments on. That opens at four, and it'll be open every weekend until Christmas uh, from four to eight, Thursday and Friday, and then from 10 to three on Saturday. I'd love to have some of the kids and the, the choral groups come and actually perform. So I'd like to, quite frankly, we're so busy putting it up, we never thought about it. But I think uh, we can talk about that offline to see if we can extend that invite. Um, and we're prepping, obviously, for our 12-19 joint meeting with the city council and the school board. So that's all the updates we have. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. All right. Uh, committee reports. All the agendas are linked in and uh, to the agenda. Are there any questions about any of the subcommittee or standing committee agendas? Question, Pam? Use your mic. Um, yes, the Lake Street School. Are we going to be discussing that later on in the meeting, or should we be discussing that now? It's in once it has to come to a motion, and then we'll oh. have a conversation. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, let's moving on. Old business. Can I entertain a motion for a second reading approval of policy AUB DKC expense authorization and reimbursement? Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Brian. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Pam. Questions, comments on that one? All right, all those in favor? Motion passes. Next, uh, second reading and approval of policy AUB-DM, cash in schools buildings. Do I have a motion, please? So, so moved. moved. Uh, second. Hey, Pat, I think I heard you over here. Brian, over here. Questions, comments on that one? Seeing none, all those in favor? Not opposed. Motion passes. Thank you. Next is a second reading and approval of policy AUB-DN, school properties disposition. Can I entertain a motion, please? So moved. Thank you, Brian. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Pat. Questions, comments on that one? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor? Motion passes. Thank you. Next is a second reading and approval of policy AUB-CB-R, superintendent of schools job description. Can I entertain a motion, please? So moved. 
Thank you, Brian. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Pam. Questions, comments on that one? Sure, Pat. You have to use your mic, please. Uh, this is for Dr. Doris. Um, I saw something in something we got in the emails this week about a new updated job description for superintendents. Have we been working with that, or is that something new? That's this right here. Do you, yeah. Or right. do you mean the job? Do you mean the um, evaluation? You mean the job description? Okay. All right. So that's this one right here. All right. Any other questions or comments? We'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Motion passes. Thank you. All right. This is new business. Uh, I can, sorry. Give me a second to scroll. All right. Can I entertain a motion to accept the RETC transition plan as presented? Can I, so, so, moved. so moved. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Pam. I'll open it up. Anyone public comment on this one where it's new business? All right, seeing none, I'll open it up to the school committee. Ladies and gentlemen, any questions, comments, debate on this one? I have some questions. Um, first of all, I wanted to ask, how much has the ASD already spent on the preliminary work of the renovation program? Um, all together, um, including what we expended to create the application, it's about 40, just over $45,000, and that's money that will have to be um, absorbed through the operating budget if you choose not to move forward with the renovations. Okay. I, I, I would note though we have a we actually have a contingency line for thirty thousand dollars in the maintenance budget so the two-thirds of that will be covered through that contingency account. Has the program the present program been profitable at all where that can be off the, the this amounting this money can be offset by that? Um, we have a surplus from last year, but that would be returned back to the member districts, so it's not really set up as a, um, as a program that would be profitable. I, I would also note that the costs of the renovations themselves would be borne by the district, not through the program. and That's part of the cost concerns that we had moving forward. Any other questions? I have Pam? some questions, too. Um, in the one million sixty-five thousand, so it it says that it includes sixty-five thousand in local costs. Was that already allocated for in our current budget? Um, no, that would have. Um, let me just talk that through for a minute. So the million sixty-five thousand dollars was the cost estimate for the total project. And because the revolving loan fund only goes to a million dollars, we had to kick in that extra. So that million dollars would have, um, our portion of that would have been, looking for that number, would have been just under $330,000 over 10 years, and that would have been built in through the annual debt service. And then the $65,000 would have had to have been allocated through our capital improvement plan um, through the funds that are already available there, I presume. The other concern, though, was that cost estimate of $1,065,000 was created what, two years ago when you were creating the application. So it's highly likely the cost estimates would have come in significantly higher than that. And we would have had to have borne the total, total increase over budget, again, presumably through our capital improvement plan. So you would have been utilizing funds from your capital improvement funds that otherwise be used for other purposes and then my other question is the cost of a new portable at the middle school how much does a portable cost we put in our ESSER application 350 correct mark I, I think so that may be a little high but I think it's in that ballpark that's gone up significantly but we're, we're talking about a two classroom portable with um, heat pump for heating and air conditioning and full utilities bathrooms um, bathrooms yeah um, that costs have gone up significantly not only because of just the nature of the construction industry right now but you have new requirements from the DUA so for example there'd be a full sprinkler system in those in those portables so they're really nice facilities they're full-size classrooms with bathrooms and um, meet all the safety codes so I guess my question is, if ESSER funds no. would cover the cost of a portable, would ESSER funds not contribute to the overage, the four hundred and fifty to $600,000 overage for 
the other improvements that would need to happen at Lake Street? Um, they might. That's not a question we've asked them. Um, they do seem to, we think they're going to approve the portable. Um, but keep in mind, we have a limited, bu even though we're, we're well funded with those funds, it's a limited budget. So those costs would have come from other needs, most likely curriculum, which is what we're using as the swing kind of remaining funds that are available have been placed into curriculum. So it, there are still competing priorities for those funds. Pam? I have a few more questions. <clears throat> um, not so much about the money part, but um, about the students. My concern is that by taking these students out of the program that they're in, I realize there's only 18 students there now, and one of those students is an AMS student that would be put in the portable. Um, my concern is that are we creating an environment where these kids are alienated from their peers, further leading to feelings of isolation and non-belonging? Um, that's one of my concerns, especially since we're taking the SOS program and the, ROT the RETC program to the high school kids, but the AMS student, there's only one kid that's going to be left out. Um, is there, has there been a discussion about maybe bringing him to the high school as well so that he's consistent with his peers that he's with at, a, at the Lake Street School. So I'd like to invite Laura Shaw and Ben up to the horseshoe to discuss that program, programming question, Pam. Uh, we did look at both the middle school kids and the high school programs. And to get started, Ben, perhaps you could describe what has happened with the middle school behavior program for 22-23, and then Laura, maybe you could help with what will the new program look like and how it will expand services for students both in terms of social access to social workers, access to specialized teachers, and access to peers, which they don't currently have. Is this working? OK, here we go. Hold this pause. So uh, due to the condition of the learning college at the middle school, those students, we had six students in a behavior program outside. They are now in the building. Uh, we currently have three students we're looking for further programming for because they have higher needs. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, it just wasn't sustainable the way it was running at the beginning of the year. So those students had to come in to be part of our school. Um, and, and the building is being used for the purposes currently. But, um, I'm, not, I'm not worried about uh, being able to add more students to that list uh, when we do have a different program next year with, uh, with a new learning cottage and a new availability uh, of programming. Uh, there are always going to be middle school students who will need that higher level of care. So, so the, the idea is to sort of, we dismantle the behavior program that existed because it just wasn't wasn't ideal, wasn't working well with the space. And um, so we would be building another program sort of from the ground up um, that would include a teacher uh, trained, at least one trained BHP, um, half to two thirds time uh, clinician um, with the possibility of getting revenue from main care like we currently do at RETC. Um, there is there is only one middle level Auburn student at RETC, but we would have more if we weren't so understaffed. Um, right now, we're incredibly understaffed, so there are there are two or three that we probably that would probably would be in the existing RETC program, but we just don't have the staff to support them. So, Mr. Wilson's doing an amazing job trying to program for them at AMS. Um, so as you said, there would likely be no shortage of um, a peer group. It is, it is, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, they're, they're not with their peers now um, at all. They're completely um, away from non-disabled peers, um, which in some way is good because they have their own sort of established culture and school, um, but it, it is, nice when you can include kids with their non-disabled peers 
even if it's for a small amount of time. And that's not easily done when you're in a separate facility. Um, so it's definitely pros and cons, but one of the pros of having a program at the middle school would be inclusion as much as each student could be successful. So um, you're talking, they're saying that you're understaffed now. Um, and we talked about, um, my question was, does the upcoming budget reflect the additional staff, such as the clinical um, social worker, the special ed teacher, and the BHP? If we don't have that now, will we have that in the future? Yeah, hope, yes, hopefully. Um, everyone that is, well, I should say most of the staff that are there at RETC will go to either EL or the middle school. Um, you know, of course, who knows what happens between now and the start of the school year, what we may have to hire, but um, so. I think to be specific, there aren't any new positions being added because of this change. The positions are already in the current budget and they'll be carried over to the next budget. So there aren't any positions being lost either? Correct. Okay. Well, no. There are, that isn't correct. There are positions being lost. Can you address which ones? Are you, are you at a point where you can say which ones? I would defer to okay. Dr. Brown. Okay. So one of the positions is a, an educational technician's position. And Mark, the other position is a classroom teacher, correct? Right. I think... As we've had difficulties hiring over a number of years, the program has slowly been downsizing since we can't hire positions. Um, we're also losing the director's position um, since it will be supervised differently from two different locations. Um, I think we'll be staffing at the level we can staff it at now, right? It's really downsizing it to what we can staff to in some ways. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, because we have lost staff throughout the year, um, we have not been able to take kids, and we, we've actually had to try and move kids back to Lewiston and back to EL and back to their home districts because we just we can't safely staff. So you're understaffed now, but you're taking the same staff to this new program. So I guess I'm confused as to, are we going to continue to be understaffed, and how are you going to help the right. kids? Great question. And one of the things that I think we forgot to mention was that, that we will only be servicing Auburn students. It will no longer be a regional program. Um, sorry. Mark, go ahead. I have a lot yeah, of questions. No, but um, Another question I have is that, so this is presently a regional educational treatment center. Um, that fits, that works with the needs of these children. They need more support than, I assume, the behavioral program, but now we're putting them with the behavioral program. So I guess my question is why did we have to have the regional, the RATC in the first place if we're able to put them with the behavioral students, or is the whole program changing? So the, the whole program is changing. Um, so there, there are varying levels of uh, behavioral needs, let's say, and sometimes they can be managed with just a teacher and some ed tech support, and other times it rises to the level where they need clinical support. And what that means is they need trained behavioral health professionals and a clinician overseeing that BHP and providing counseling services. Um, so. You could theoretically have a program at the middle school that has, I don't know, let's say eight students. Only four of them had the clinical need um, for which we could bill and, and receive revenue, and maybe four don't have quite that high of a need. Um, so it's, it's, it's really on an individual basis. There is sort of a spectrum of, of need behaviorally. If, if Excuse me. So with the new high school, you also have some new opportunities with the new space there. We realized as we were looking at the plans that when they originally designed the high school, they designed it specifically for RETC and SOS in a space in the back corner of the building because that's what it reads on the plans. And they'll actually have their own entrance, which is significant for some students to be able to come directly into the program from where they're being dropped off. There'll only be one exit out into the main stream of the school 
so it'll be easy to supervise students, easier to supervise students coming and going, and you'll have that direct drop-off, which we didn't have as an opportunity at the existing school, and so there's some new opportunities with the new high school there as well. And there was a section there, you, I just want to reiterate what you just said, Mark, is that the new school was designed with the RETC program, and I see Scott nodding his head in the back, with the RETC program to be housed at the new EM. Yes, it's actually a okay. suite. They have offices for social workers. They have small group space. They have some community space. They have a larger classroom space. Um, Rod Botot, the assistant mm -hmm. director or out-of-district coordinator, I guess, uh, okay. will be actually moving over there and housed there next year. Um, so the, I think the space was well planned for the eventual transfer of the program back to the high school. Okay, thank you, Mark. Jason? I just have one question. Will this uh, pres uh, proposal increase the likelihood of a better outcome for Auburn students now and in the future? So I believe the answer to that is yes. The students are going to be in better physical space, whether they are in a learning cottage at the middle school or in brand new space at the new high school. What Mark didn't include was the new space includes a kitchen area where they can do some culinary arts things. They'll have access to some of the other programs because they're located in that wing. So yes, I do believe it will have better outcomes for our students. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Clarissa? I, um, I have a couple questions, um, or more than a couple. One question, so since you're up here, I'll ask that first. Um, I guess I'm generally in favor of this idea, um, but I wanted to know, in terms of like legal, like the whole least restrictive environment thing, I thought that's what we're sort of supposed to be aspiring to, which is having people as integrated as possible. So I'm curious as to whether this is more aligned with that or whether the RATC was just an exception to that. That's one question. But then the other one is, I guess I'm, cur I'm curious I have three in this area, how parents feel about this, parents of the affected students, like if they're generally supportive or not. And I'm guessing since there's not, I mean, I know this is a really tricky thing, but I would be interested in hearing parents' responses. And then I know this is, the third thing is, even though I'm supportive of it sort of in the long run, it kind of feels like there's this short-term risk because I'm hearing a lot of like, we think we, which is, you know, we think we this in terms of what might happen in the short run. And I know that with some of these students, that short run risk, is like really falling to the cracks. I feel like I would feel more comfortable if there was a more clear articulation of like, here's what we're going to do to sort of for like a safety net in between that transition time. Or I just kind of want to know, like, do we know we're going to have these things in place when it rolls around next year, or what the timeline is? I would say yes. Yeah. 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 Speaking for the, uh, speaking, well, middle school and high school, I, I can fairly confidently say yes, things will be in place. There will be a cohort of students, and, you know, knock on wood, you know, the staffing that we need to support those students. Um, and, you know, in regards to your question about um, least restrictive environment, uh, that's a great question. Um, and so sort of the model that a, lo that a lot of school district schools and school districts are using in Maine, and, and I, I don't know outside of Maine, but I know in southern Maine and um, even western Maine, um, districts are creating their own sort of day treatment type programs connected to schools, Portland, Saco, Oxford Hills region, all have these, these sort of um, day treatment type programs. And number one, you know, it is, it is best practice to have, and, and really legally we are obligated to have students be with their non-disabled peers as much as possible. Um, but the reality is there are, uh, you know the special purpose private schools like the Spurwings and Margaret Murphy, and though you know those, they are folding. They they're not profitable. They're some of them are clo are closing, and waiting lists are years long. Um, so you know it does definitely does behoove us to have you know some high quality programs in the district that are at that day treatment level. Oh, I can't, I haven't personally spoken to any parents um, 
re- whether or not they support this or not. I haven't heard anything pro or con from any parents, so I can't. And then I just had one other question about cost related for a mark, which was it, the way I read the proposal, the cost emphasis is really on sort of fixed costs. But I was wondering if like the operating cost, because I'm imagining Lake Street is more expensive to sort of maintain and heat and everything than a new cottage in the high school would be. So I'm just, I didn't see that, but I also arrive late and don't have that with me. Yeah, so they wouldn't, I, but they wouldn't be in a cottage at the new high school. They would be in the new high school. Right. Oh, at AMS. Okay. You know, I, I think it's so much difficult to compare because you have a regional program with three different stakeholders paying into it, so it's a much larger budget, and we're only paying a proportion. Um, so I think, roughly speaking, it breaks even, and I think if you look at that, um, to some extent, salary increases would push the price up, but then we're saving... Um, from not having those same operating costs pushes it back down. So I, I think when say in general terms, it's roughly about even to what we're paying now. Uh, it will be structured differently because what you'll see is more staff in your personnel budget, but then you're going to save on the tuition line that we're paying into RETC right now. And of course, when I say it breaks even, roughly speaking from an operational standpoint, that doesn't factor in all of those additional costs we talked about a few minutes ago in terms of the cost of the million dollar debt service and, and those other capital related items. That would need to go into the Lake Street School. Pardon? That would need to go into the Lake Street Correct. School in order to, right. main, in order to right. maintain and the so facility. I'm thinking that of that in terms of cost avoidance. If we... And have we, Mark, I'm sorry, I'm jumping in if anyone had a question. Um, the water issue at Lake Street School, have we even, even begun to think about what the cost of just the repairs of any of that would be? No, see, we were looking at a couple of additional costs from the architect. The, the, are you talking about the water penetration yes. of the building? That was one piece. The other piece was the fact that the site plan would require an additional access road. And so you really can't ask the architect to begin to put costs to that when you're putting a hold on the project and you're really not sure of where that site plan may go. But we know they would be significant to, to resolve. Okay. All right, great. All right, any other questions, Pat? This isn't really a question, but when they were putting together the, the building plans um, to include the space, I think it was originally, and Scott can back me up, for um, alternative school, um, several of us went down to the new Sanford High School and looked at the facility, which was just about what we ended up with. Um, uh, Franklin decided to stay there, but I think this is a great idea because the kids, they will be you know, in their own space, which is what they need for what their issues are. But if they want to go to chorus or an art class or whatever, they're right there on in the building. And I think it's great. I, I think it's going to be a good plan for these kids. Okay, thank you, Pat. Any other questions? Pam? My concern isn't so much for the high school kids, because since we've already planned that system, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, this was this was these kids were always going to go to the high school at, once it's built correct these the high school kids were always the RETC kids were they always going to end up at the high school in that program that is being built in the new high school so it's my understanding that there was always always a space in the new high school for RETC and SOS separate classrooms separate entrance as mark described community space kitchen and so on so it's designed the, to accommodate them should the move happen okay so the move wasn't necessarily going to happen or is this something that we were planning so we've built this for these kids is that was was going to be happening in the fall i think the original people of the original designers of the school i don't believe are here so that's kind of a question that is i don't think anyone i isn't, don't know that anyone isn't answer. sos there now SOS the is there now. That's correct. So that, in the yeah. old school. So that's regardless of the future of Lake Street School. SOS was go went into the high school. Is there now? Yes. I, yes. Mark. I think, and this may have been a victim of the all of the changes in personnel taking place at the administrative level, but you were making an application for renovations to Lake Street School at the same time that you were putting the plans together for Edward Little, and I think some of us realized 
as we were looking at that over time and looking at on top of the staffing difficulties and all of that, that there was an opportunity that we hadn't been looking at and we didn't want to continue to put money into Lake Street knowing we had the facility at the high school mm -hmm. because then you're, you know, you're making, you have to sign a commitment with the, the DOE because you're getting a significant subsidy at taxpayer expense, but a significant subsidy to Auburn to have those renovations take place. So I think it was that sense that we have to make a decision now since you're, you're moving forward and you have to move forward with those renovations if you've accepted the money. Um, so we maybe could have planned it better, but that would have been a decision well back when we ex said we were going to put in the application for the for the renovations. So I guess my concern is the middle school. And um, as far as I know, we I realize we have one child that's going to be going to the middle school from this program and is going to be put in with the behavioral program. Um, now, these are two different programs. One. I'm, I'm assuming, and please correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but the RETC student will require different um, help and assistance than the behavioral student, or no? Why, why is the, and I guess why is the RETC p person not in the behavioral pr program now? Because, well, there is no behavioral program. That was dismantled. Yeah. Okay. And there are students right now at AMS that would have long been oh, yeah. gone to RETC but cannot go because they don't have the staff. At RETC. Right, yeah. because we have, you know, if we have 18 kids, uh, 10 or 11, 11 of them aren't, aren't Auburn. They're tuition from Lewiston, RSU 16. Um, so, you know, we, we can't say, okay, suddenly you, you know, you've paid, you can't have your students, they have to plan for those students too. Um, so there are students at the middle level who frankly have probably need more clinical support than maybe even some kids we have there. Um, it's just they're not there because it's not an option right now. And by having that cottage, these, these students would have the opportunity availability of the clinical social worker, the behavioral health um, professional, and the teacher, the special ed teacher. But now would they be cloistered in that cottage or like, I guess I'm in my mind, I'm, a, I'm seeing like these kids stuck in this cottage, even though it's beautiful, and not associating with the other kids. So that's been the design of the middle school for a few years now. Uh, I think, uh, you know, past administration has put together a program out there for the purpose of you know, providing that extra layer of support. There's a social worker currently at the middle school that was tied to a program out back. I call it the out back, but it's a, it's a learning college, just just for lack of space. So the middle school right now doesn't have availability to bring the kids fully inside the building, um, you know, and to keep everyone safe at the same time. Some of these students have slightly aggressive behaviors uh, that require us to have to clear classrooms, and uh, it, you know, it, it it'd be better to have that smaller environment. It would be better to have it physically attached, but I think this is going to be the best we can do, and it's, uh, it's going to be a healthy program. You know, there's been talk of moving some of the ROTC folk over to the middle school, so the programming could be very similar to what it is now, just in a new facility. I think that's the hope. Oh. Okay. I'm about to call for a vote, ladies and gentlemen, so get your last comments or questions in, please, Pat. Can you use your mic, please, Pat? Used to be automatic on this. <laughs> Um, is there an expectation that some of these students would um, graduate out of the program, or can you expect the numbers that we see at the middle school now to continue all the way up through at the high school? Well, evidence of what we were able to do so far is that we've had six students in a, in a self-contained program out in our learning cottage, and when moving them in, we found we only have three or four that really need a higher level of help. So, you know, they're continually graduating into the middle school, and it's been, it's been fun to see their growth. Uh, when they're in resource rooms, uh, but we do have a couple of students that do need an extra layer of care. But you know, I think ideally, what happens over a period of time is that you know the purpose of special education is to work itself out of a job. <laughs> so these students are learning and growing every day, and it's really hard to tell if these students will graduate by the end of eighth grade and not have to go to a program at the high school, or if they'll need further assistance. But it's it's really fluid. You've got kids yeah. moving in that need that. You've got kids who, for whatever reason, have developed 
you know, mental health issues and behaviors. But we've, I've seen a ton of kids be stabilized and be able to go to less restrictive settings as well. So it's really fluid in and out. Okay. okay, that's good to know. Thank you. All right. Uh, so thank you both very much for all your information. At this time, school committee, I'm going to call for a vote. Right now, the motion is to accept the RETC plan as presented. I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Seeing any opposed? Seeing none, motion passes. Thank you for the conversation, everyone. So at this point, we have, uh, we have voted to accept the RETC transition plan as presented. Therefore, the next motion is to a motion to vacate the property at 80 Lake Street School, Auburn, Maine, and return it to the city of Auburn, uh, effective June 30th, 2023. Do I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you, Brian. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, thank you, Dan. Questions on that one? Right. Have we before? Sorry, I have yeah, one question. No, have we ever considered? Um, we've talked about this in DEI, and we've talked about this in the Health and Safety Committee that we have a 350 percent growing um, homeless population in Auburn. And um, has it ever been discussed that this school could be used as something to help with homelessness? So I think. So I think at this point, and it's not a sell, um, it is essentially turning it back over and what the city of Auburn decides to do with it at that point, um, they'll have to have conversations within the city, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Mayor, but they will have to have conversations with how to best use that facility. So. Just, to just to clarify, our current zoning dictates what uses are uh, allowed for any building within or any parcel of land within our city. And currently we do not have um, an ordinance that allows for any type of homeless shelter anywhere within the city. Okay, thank you. All right. Any other questions? All right. Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. Um, all those in favor to vacate the property at 80 Lake Street and return it to the city of Auburn. All those in favor? All right. Motion passes. Thank you. All right. Uh, upcoming meetings. You have December 8th, which is tomorrow, the finance meeting. Uh, the 13th will be the uh, policy subcommittee meeting. That is in person upstairs, fourth floor. Is that correct, Dr. Doris? Thank you. Uh, December 14th is a meeting that uh, school committee members, you can cross right off your list. That uh, exact session will not be happening on the 14th. We'll let you know if a new date is needed. Uh, the 19th will be the joint council, uh, the joint meeting between the city council and the school committee. 21st, regular school committee, and then we have some January committee meetings happening. At this point, I'll call for future agenda items. All right, seeing none, a motion to adjourn, please. So moved. Thank you, Brian. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Clarissa. All those in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you, 708.